So, so what, what, what do you think about the future of commercial remote sensing? Anybody can get started. <laughs> uh, well, there's, a, there's a, uh, a couple of programs going on now, to one at NASA and one at NOAA, that I know of anyway, to try to support and um, grow the, um, the remote sensing, uh, both hardware development and data product development, these data buy programs that they're doing. And uh, I know that uh, the, the people that I know that are involved or peripherally involved at both agencies, some of them are pretty excited about it, some of them aren't, and, uh, but it's happening. Um, it wasn't, I think in both cases it wasn't really their idea. It was imposed on them from above, Congress basically, and the White House. And uh, I think it's a good thing to check it out and see if it's worthwhile. I think uh, from Noah's perspective, I know that they're, uh, the thing they're most, most nervous about about relying on private data sources, you know, satellite remote sensing data sources for, um, for inputs to their operational weather forecasting, you know, effort um, is not necessarily the quality of the data because that's pretty straightforward to, to validate. Um, and there's evidence that, you know, you can do even some of these CubeSat things that have been developed here, you know, or presented here today. There's ev plenty of evidence that you can do a nice, careful job of calibrating radiances and scattering cross-sections and things with uh, private industry and with smaller satellites that are cheaper and has more of a, whatever, <coughs> profit margin for, you know, a reasonable business model. But um, the thing they're worried about more than that is reliability. Um, they need to have that data there every three hours as inputs to their assimilation models to generate those forecasts and, you know, the whole countries relying on them. That's their charter. And uh, um, that's the part of it I know that they're most concerned about and is the focus of the current data buy evaluation process is to see if they can reliably deliver that data day after day, month after month, and that the calibration stability is, or that the calibration is stable and consistent over that time because that's sort of essential for the stuff to be valuable for forecast models. And uh, I think uh, just in general, that sort of thing is not as amenable to pri that sort of operating mode isn't as natural for private industry as, uh, as coming up with a new model for next year so that you can make more money because people want to buy something newer, that sort of thing, as opposed to doing something that's sort of exciting for a while but then gets kind of boring when it's like got to be really reliably produced. But, you know, if that's what the customer wants, hopefully that's what they'll do. I think it's really an early stage right now whether this whole thing's gonna, how this whole thing's going to play out. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I would think one of the main concerns would be in continuity. If they decide it's no longer in our business model, they can lose a key product. They have to rely upon another vendor to pick it up. So I think that would also be a concern. But there are counterexamples. Contractors have provided long-term services to the government and have maintained that. But you know, if you were, if you like you said, if you're leaning on that capability for some critical forecasting capability, that company could decide, well, it's no longer in our business interest, so we're not going to give it to you anymore, and that could create a big gap. Whereas you would have much more leverage within the federal agency. Yeah, yeah. I think you know one sort of typical way to deal with that if you're the, you know, on the the buying buyer side is to have multiple sources. And that's exactly what they're doing now for each one of these critical data products that they're serious about. I, I, don't, I don't know that the one at the top of the list right now with, with NOAA to, to seriously consider buying, buying um, you know, data products for their forecast models is uh, radio occultation, atmospheric profiles, and bedding angles. That's um, the one that they've they're doing that now and doing performance evaluations and so on, and they're doing it with more than one company. So are they tending to get the least processed version of the data, or, or do they want the company to process it all the way and just get the end result or something in between? Yeah, so I think the preference from the government side 
is to get the process data with very detailed documentation about how they got there from the raw data. And the preference from the industry side is to provide the process data without that because it's <laughs> because a lot of it's proprietary and yeah. that's sort of where things are at right now. So where do you think it'll go? No, I, it's really just it's really just getting going, and there's very strong opinions on both sides of the, at, at at the agencies right now, and and um, you know Congress. Uh, there's really strong differences of opinion about it. So you know, it's an exciting time. What about customers? I'm not government as a customer, but looking at developing a value added product for. Or exploration industries, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think I, I agree with what's been said. I'm skeptical about how reliable it will be for a, you know, an infrastructure safety of life product driving weather models. But you know, I think some of these private companies, if they can develop some specialized value added products that address a certain market, that that probably is it's more viable. Yeah, I think there are some good examples of that. For example, futures markets. Mm. Uh, yeah, they, right. There, there are companies that feed right. that need based on what's happening. Yeah, right. and the sort of actuar actuarial part of insurance right. companies also need that sort of information to help them decide what to charge for, you know, flood insurance and things like that. You know, I see sometimes see people use this example of this commercial data by commercial industry around um, providing imaging. And uh, one pitfall I see of that is using a model, as a model for other applications like weather forecasting is um, a lot of those imaging products um, don't have the dynamic range in terms of the observable that one would require in say a forecast model ingesting the data as opposed to an image of a product. So, so those image products work for a lot of commercial data buys like GOI will provide you imagery from their, from their satellite constellation. Um, or you can go get it from Google Maps. I mean, they're, you know, I think they're by, anyway, the point is that that is a different flavor of data than you would need to ingest into a weather forecast model. So that model, there are details there that one needs to mine that aren't gonna translate very well. So that's an example of how data buy can work well for commercial imaging, but it doesn't translate necessarily. Right. In some in some in some cases, the dynamic range of the data for like you know passive microwave. I mean, it's tiny in comparison. It's tiny. I mean, the whole dynamic range is a couple hundred kelvin in the brightness, and even smaller for atmospheric channels. And the you know the system temperature is like 600 to a thousand kelvin, somewhere in that range, and you're only moving around by a couple hundred kelvin out of a thousand. So that's like about like a dB of dynamic range total. Like that's the total dynamic range of all the science information, a dB. And uh, the only reason it's worthwhile is because you you, can, you nail down the accuracy and the precision. Otherwise, it's not yeah, it's not going to happen. So you got it takes a lot of you know TLC basically in the data handling. I think similar along those lines, the other concern I, I have is, you know, they talk about how fast some of these private companies can bring a product to, to market, but, you know, as far as, you know, producing the, the science product and, and some of these calibrations, I mean, there's, there's a body of expertise that's needed to do that. And, that, I mean, it's a limited, finite resource of that body of expertise. And developing new algorithms and, 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 and models, I mean, that can't be accelerated, I think, as fast as you know, building the next generation of a piece of hardware. So, you know. Right, but a lot of the NOAA operational it, it, stuff right, is not right. in that. Right, right. It's not like that. It's, it's like they have the these, yeah, they have right. these models. They have these right. huge aging mm -hmm. LEO assets right. that have to be replaced. Right. And one option is to send up another mm -hmm. three or four you know, $800 million satellites, right. and a different option is to send up a whole bunch of CubeSats if they can deliver. Oh. And, and it's just, it's the same radiances they want, it, but. How about, I mean, if again, why, why not an intermediate step where I just have a private company can build $800 million? That's what happens now, no one doesn't build oh, anything. Right, but I mean, 
can maybe take more of a role building that, but for three hundred million dollars. So, I don't know. I'm just throwing. And say so, you know, either, either you're saying it's either that. So or, you don't make as or, much or, money. Right. Of course. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. It's just the business model's not as good. Right. Okay. You know, I mean, these CubeSat companies that are doing these private data buy things that are really participating in it, they're not the big aerospace companies, right. the right. traditional ones. They're these kind of lean, mean, new startups with, uh, you know, just a handful of people that started them up, and the bigger ones have a couple hundred employees, and yeah, it's a totally different perspective. All right, so, any questions from the audience? First, thank you all for being here and to the hosts. This is a bit of a different question. So, you know, the work that you're all doing, we're doing is really, you know, moving in some traditional ways, but also some new ways too. But looking back, say, at within the U.S., uh, <coughs> undergraduate curriculum in <coughs> disciplines that might feed into graduate programs that then produce the people that can do this work both in academia but then also in industry. What are the next steps there? What's missing currently in the education space that is needed to help us move to where that next step might be? <laughs> or in high schools or in wherever. It might be. No, 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 you know, so I did this, um, this student project for six or eight years a while ago um, called Magic Bus. I don't know if you remember that. It's like this thing. It's this website now that you can go to to see when the buses are going to come and, you know, and time when you go stand out in the cold and that kind of thing. So that was, uh, that was invented by the these, these student team over the course of a uh, number of years. That, that, that was like the, the directing the project. And after about the third year, once we, start, once we went online and the buses started you know, we had these, this online thing that you could, and this app that you could go to to see when the bus was going to come, and and, uh, and it was, you know, pretty popular. Um, so within, yeah, within a year after we went online, I started getting calls from um, a few different VC groups who wanted to fund startup to, to do it. And uh, I told the students that were in the group about it, and I figured I, they'd just jump on it. And it took, like, Two years before somebody said yes, these students, you know, just uh, they uh, they all wanted to go work for big companies and have safe jobs, I guess. And uh, it was like two years before it happened, and it was uh, it, the student was uh, uh, Jahan Ka, this guy. He had grown up in Ann Arbor, went to Pioneer. He was an undergrad here. He was a double E, like a joint double E CS major. And he wanted to be an entrepreneur and run a startup and stuff. And he was, you know, I had a couple hundred students go through this project over the course of time, and none of them wanted to do it. it was, I was really surprised, but, you know, and he did. And he and then there was another guy who was, uh, um, he was getting his MBA, and he was on the team to help with a bunch of business model related stuff. And, uh, and the two of them started this company, uh, Sidecar, Sidetrack, Sidecar. Um, and, uh, it was, they started it out here and um, were like doing a bunch of online management of traffic stuff for the, the, a couple of limousine services in Detroit. And then they moved out to the Bay Area and uh, got bigger. And right when they moved to the Bay Area was right when Uber started. And it's very similar technology, very similar. And, uh, you know, Uber won and they lost in the end. But uh, after about a year, Uber bought out a bunch of our intellectual property, and uh, and we had licensed it all originally when they first started the start. And uh, so it was great. I started I started getting royalty checks like every quarter because we had this stuff licensed, and you know I was one of the co-inventors on it, and from Uber, and that went on for a number of years, and then the company got bought out by Ford, and the guy John, this you know student who started it, he moved back here from the Bay Area, and he's now like a VP at Ford to help with like autonomous vehicle stuff. And it all grew out of him being, you know, wanting to take a chance on the startup. And uh, so I think, you know, for 
you know, I think that was a great, that's a great story and there should be more of that stuff. And for whatever reason, the culture with the students wasn't amenable to that for most, for, you know, the first hundred students I asked until Jahan came along. So, you know, maybe the undergraduate program could have more of a entrepreneurial flavor to it, or you have, you know, you have to take some courses and I don't know if there are courses in this university about startups and how to do them, maybe by, in the business school, maybe? Well, COE Center for Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. one of their focus. Yeah. I think at Thomas Reed from starting before. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, and they actually mm -hmm. they do. somehow get students to want to take risks with their careers. I mean, that's what it is. There's really no better time, you know, yeah, right when you right. get out of school, you don't have a mortgage yet, you don't have a bunch of kids to worry about sending to college. I mean, there's no better time to start a startup. You can work 20 hours a week. <coughs> Or day, a day, I mean, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's really, there's really no better time to go for it than you know in your twenties. How about it, students? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I was really surprised. It took so yeah, long for me to find somebody to bite on it, and they just like it. They totally scored. I mean, the company, you know, Ford bought them out for like forty million dollars after a few years out in the Bay Area, and they brought him to the VP, and and. Uh, um, and actually, the bad news for me is like right when Ford bought them out, um, there was some legal reason, I don't know what it is, but that was like the day my royalty check stopped. <laughs> so something, they somehow bought the intellectual property that was routed through that other company and then right. Michigan got cut out of the deal somehow. So I don't know what that's all about, but anyway. Um, Would anyone else agree with that though? That it, it's, it surprised me not a lot of students would have be interested in that because I would have yeah I had so grew, I had like three different VC groups the, that started calling me and saying right. we've got come on right. get me some students and we'll do it and I kept asking them and they wouldn't nobody wanted to go for it because these guys all grew up on the dot com era so okay so no, I'm surprised I don't know yeah, yeah it surprised me too yeah. but the college is working to um, explore ways of expanding what they're calling experiential opportunities for undergraduates of which uh, the entrepreneurial aspect is just one, one piece of it all. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there's definitely a thrust in that direction to, to want to go there, whether yeah. you can pull it off. Depends, you know. And once they said yes, there was a whole bunch of support that came out yeah. of the woodwork mm -hmm. from, yeah. from Lansing. Mm -hmm. they, like, they had people that would, they paid for their rent for this, you know, mm -hmm. this office space that was like up on Plymouth, they like got them a bunch of space mm -hmm. and they gave them this support with like people to do their budgets and stuff and just all this mm -hmm. state support because it was a startup mm -hmm. with VC money. And uh, yeah, they, but they had to say yes and like go for it first before that stuff all got triggered. So we are, yeah. we are applying for a, for a department. I'm in charge of the East too. have a new mass of engineering program. They in a new mass of engineering program, yeah, a requirement of four credits of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's required for the bachelor's required. degree? Yeah. You probably master's, 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 master's degree. Master's degree? Okay. Master's degree. okay. Yeah. And uh -huh. it's being uh, we approved. And what do you do? Do you like form a little fake company and have to like do the whole thing? I would give a group to the classes in the center of entrepreneurship. Four credits minimum. But what do you do? You sit in a lecture room and listen to people talk about taking risks? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, about, 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 Kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really, it's a cultural personality thing yeah. to be willing to really take a risk with your career, you know, I mean, for something like that. I mean, one of the things I was told at, at you know, because I'm in the same geographic areas as, as you guys, is that um, they're actually, as far as like the the VC funding and all that in, in the Midwest University doesn't really exist. It's all out in Silicon Valley. So even startup companies, you know, out here at Purdue or um, at least as far as when people depends talk on the people. kind of money. I mean, they know right. like the pharmaceutical VC people know right, all right. about Michigan. Right, right. And there's a lot of that money that comes in right. here. So, and like biosciences and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So it depends like on the, the area. Yeah. You know, tech um, is. So I don't know. At least I mean, at one time I was told that that's that's a problem that some startup companies from from Purdue are having or were having yeah. at, at last time I was looked into it. Yeah, but I think if you have a good product, they will come. Yeah. You would hope. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of uh, presentations today talk about <coughs> various instances and sort of mitigations for RFI. Um, and, you know, recently they just concluded the uh, World Radio Communications um, sort of 2019 deliberations. Did charge. 5G win? Yeah. yeah um, that's what I thought. <laughs> and, you know, access to spectrum is just generally more contested and congested. And, 
then I, I, I guess the question I have to ask the panel in, in the remote sensing is you, you consider your protected science bands to be protected indefinitely, and do you necessarily think that, um, you know, what is a mitigation strategy going to the future? Do you think all interference can be backed out, or is there, you know, what's the focus that should, should happen if you want to continue doing remote sensing? Yes, that's an interesting question. So, so you know, I and, and Roger, both of us, have spent a big chunk of our careers developing tricky little signal processing gadgets to get rid of uh, RFI, to clean out noisy data and still do good science with it. And, you know, we both spent a whole bunch of our time developing that stuff because it's such a problem and it's, you know, 99% likely to get worse in the future in unpredictable ways. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny that, you know, I, I've done a lot of it and published papers about it and sort of bragged about how clever my mitigation algorithms are and technology and stuff. And I really get trashed a lot by traditional science communities that use this data because they say, basically, now that we've got these nice mitigation schemes, there's way less motivation on the part of the bad guys, you know, the calm, the calm community to be careful and to follow the rules. And they know that the sign, they read the papers too, and they know that now they've got these ways of, avoid, of getting around all the problems we're causing. So the problems aren't as bad as they would have been. And so we'll make them worse. And, uh, um, you know, I don't know, maybe there's some truth in that, but, uh, um, yeah, it's science. really, yeah, I've really got like really bitched at by a bunch of eminent scientists because of the stuff that I've done in my career developing mitigation technology. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Jan Kerr is a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah, but he's, yeah, he's sort of like the loudest one, but a lot of people, there's a lot of people like that. Um, yeah, these like eminent scientists that, you know, lead, um, you know, satellite missions or have a, a big voice and in government, you know, use of satellite data for weather and science and climate science, who uh, think it's a really bad thing to develop technology to try to overcome these problems because then we're never going to be able to get the calm like, people to shut down. How likely is that to happen? <laughs> How I mean, five G one and everybody and that I mean, everybody knew that that was a clear, you know, destructive influence on the quality of weather forecasting. You know, it's going to be, you know, within, I don't know, a few hundred kilometers of the coastline near any major city 10 years from now, that 5G signal is going to show up in all these humidity bands of all these standard standard weather satellites. And the, you know, forecast quality is going to suffer. It's going to happen. And, you know, for eight years, I was on the committee on radio frequencies, and I think some other... Yeah, I've been on before. <laughs> What, so, a, what a thankless committee. So, so basically, they're... they're this is yeah, a, this National Academies Committee that tries to slow down right. the onslaught of co commercial use of spectrum where people are trying to do science yeah. and push back. And it's just... It, it's so All you can do is slow them down. You can't stop them. Yeah, I mean, at every corner. So it's, it's remote sensing and astronomy. Yeah. But at every, every, every case that comes up, you make... You make the argument uh, that the science is important. You back it up with statistics on lives saved, property saved, weather forecasting importance, etc. And the counter argument is consistently, yes, but this is a multi-billion dollar industry that will create jobs that will create revenue. Great. Right. And they have these lists of how many jobs it'll create in each one of the congressional districts of each of the people, in, you know, that are responsible for signing off on this bill that they're requesting. Yeah, they're very organized about it. Very organized. You get that yeah. much money, it's easy to get a lot of people behind, behind you. To right, you out. right. And it's the people to trying to stop them are just a bunch of amateurs like us yeah. who mm -hmm. don't know how to lobby anything and we're volunteering our time to go try to rebut these really well crafted arguments from industry. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, so. it's frustrating yeah. um, work. I mean, it's important work, but it ultimately it, it grinds you. But, you know, I mean, 5G, it'll be nice to have, like, HD video on your cell phone. That'll be nice. I mean, that's what we're going to get, right? I guess. I don't know. We, we toyed with a lot of different ideas as, as to how to deal with that. Some, some of them were kind of absurd. Like, for example, how do we get our voice heard? Well, so one suggestion was, it was just right after the movie Contact came out, big radio astronomy movie. That, mm. So the idea was, let's go get Jodie Foster... To, to go speak to Congress on our behalf on the importance of radio astronomy. That didn't come out. Um, 
She didn't do it, or it didn't, didn't make any difference? We never made it contact with her. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. just something to the amateur nature of the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. You know, we weren't, that was, that's not our bad look. I mean, that's yeah, it's not what we do. And the other, other opportunities that we've explored were uh, trying to work cooperatively with uh, certain pieces of the communication industry so that they could do build-in technologies that would make it easier to mitigate. Time multiplexing ideas mm -hmm. was time sync signals sent out through networks that would allow us to mitigate it. Again, though, we never really got their interest because they were focused on that billion dollar industry. And this was just a distraction. You know what the right answer might be? It's just everybody should just switch to signals of opportunity. Because there's just going to be more opportunities. <laughs> and I actually got a similar complaint that you got was that when we were, well, there was actually was a proposal we were all brainstorming you know, related to, you know, just selling this in terms of the uh, the mitigation, and I was told, well, that might not go over well because then you'll basically be saying, oh, it's okay to transmit all these things. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's something you have to be careful about. But I do know um, in, in my, you know, the other world, I, I, I moved into navigation. That's also a big concern because the GPS bands are being Getting stepped upon. on by, by com. Um, right, and so then they can make the safety of, of life argument. Um, well, no, they can, and they, the they've, got, of they've got the... Oh, the wild card, right. which is like the safety of the nation from attack. I mean, right. They've got, but, but, they've got no, the defense no, wild but, card. But what I'm saying is, 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 can we make that same argument? I mean, in terms of a applications of remote sensing related to, to national defense. It, I mean, it's a little more specious, I think. You than, think so? Than being able to steer cruise missiles, I, th I think so. Mm -hmm. But, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, as I said, we've, yeah. made, we've been making that argument with respect to severe weather. Okay. And, and that it impacts civilians. Okay. Uh, that also <coughs> impacts the military. It hasn't caught on. It hasn't been able to trump the... <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I shouldn't... Can I change that word? Yes. But anyway, to get over the... <laughs> but it's a billion dollar industry. I mean, and the reality is, you know, I guess maybe I'm bragging a little bit. You know, the mitigation techniques actually do work. <laughs> you know, uh, they do. They they certainly are a lot better than not having anything. So, yeah. So I have a question. Do you think in 10, 20, 50 years, maybe more, we have to share a science instrument and a communication instrument? Do you think that's possible? <clears throat> I think yeah, I think it's very I think it's very unlikely that won't be the case. And I think that, you know, <coughs> like right now, just in general, sort of both sort of philosophically and technically <coughs> You know, spectrum management is called spectrum management because the thing you manage is just what frequency you're at, and that's it, and that's mm -hmm. the way it works. But in principle, that could be expanded. Right. You could do spectrum and temporal management, and you can't transmit this frequency when that satellite is visible over the horizon. You could do polarization management. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things besides spectrum you could manage to prevent or mitigate interference, and none of that really happens yet. And part of it is just sort of, you know, whatever, the office, the government office is called the Spectrum Management Office, right. just the name. And I think one of the problems, this was when they were talking about navigation signals, one of the problems is that the way the laws are written, it's, it's based on you know, the technology, you know, decades ago where you, you, know, you tuned a certain band and you have, you know, allowable voice floor. Right. And you get, you get but, that right, right length and right. you get that wavelength. Right. And so, so where the, I mean, in, in the past one, where the, the threat to the GNSS was coming from was they were looking at these ultra wide bands it wasn't. It was, it was a very wide band signal, but they they set they they got um, you know good protection because of the design of the waveform. Right. And so you just, so you they, let the you let the wave you let right. the spectrum overlap. Right. right. So yeah. so they could look at oh they're below <laughs> the noise floor requirements on, on these bands, but you know they're still transmitting a signal out there, and how that could correlate with other things nobody really understood. Yeah, so yeah. so actually there's something about this. This is a little off topic. I thought it was really interesting. It was on the it was on you know this morning. When I got up this morning, there was this thing on NPR, this was around 7 this morning, about it was this technology, you know, like AM modulation explanation for why men think that Hillary Clinton's voice is so shrill, and just women in general. Um, and it was really interesting. It was, okay. because, yeah, it was because historically, you know, when radio first came out, like in like the 1910s or 20s or something, there wasn't, a, there was no spectrum management, there was no FCC and all these different cities were transmitting and they were all stepping on each other. So then spectrum management came in and they, uh, 
they started allocating channels for in as, you know for AM, and they allocated ten mega or ten kilohertz for each of the channels to spread them out, and everyone was using AM back then, and AM doubles the bandwidth. So you real, right when you up convert, so you've only got five megahertz of baseband or five kilohertz of baseband to work with, and so that was like how all these early uh, microphones were developed, and and the amp the preamps and microphones were all developed with this cutoff at five kilohertz because of the uh, spectrum management regulations, and the uh, and then yeah they had this other section about like the average spectral range for consonants and vowels for men and women, and women are speak a little bit higher, and vowels have lower part are in the lower part of the spectrum, and consonants are in the upper part. And most of the consonant spectrum for women is above five kilohertz, just above, like between five and a half and seven is where most of the, the power in the consonants that women and for men it's just below five kilohertz. So when women talk on the radio AM, you know, with these old old uh, um, microphones, they uh, you can't really hear the vowels very well. I mean the consonants very well, and so it makes it harder to harder to understand than in FM, and uh, they tend to speak louder just because they're getting clipped off because, you know, a big chunk of the, you know, the power in their, just their whole integrated power spectrum is just above the cutoff, basically, so they just got to raise it up, and so they tend to, not as much now, but back then when AM was everything, they tend to just spot, speak um, high, at a higher volume than their normal speaking voice, which makes you sound more shrill. Yeah, it was really interesting. <laughs> it was yeah, I was on NPR this morning. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of related. So you know, I mean, if you just opened up the bandwidth with smarter modulation or coding decoding stuff and let the spectra overlap with each other, you can pull it back out again. You know, and yeah, I mean, it's not very hard to make a microphone that works above five kilohertz nowadays. <laughs> yeah. So what we were trained to to listen to sound based upon, you know. With radios or design. Well, yeah, yeah it actually, it was really interesting. It was, it was okay. this long thing that went on, and it also it had this whole thing about the arc of development of the kinds of receivers that went into the early car radios, because that was right in the 20s when they started putting uh, radios in cars, and the technology, you know, and they were trying to keep everything as cheap as possible, keep the recurring costs down, and everything was all about that five kilohertz cutoff. And so, yeah, in early car radios, you couldn't really, yeah, you couldn't hear the the consonants of women at all, and that's why there are hardly any female DJs early on because they didn't test well. Just you know, it's all this stuff. Maybe that's why Hillary didn't win. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. All right. Well, I think that was a great discussion um, <laughs> about.